The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 10 Aaron fell to the ground and started to cry. There was no mistaking that horrifying sound, the sudden change in cadence, the slight dip in revs, the low moan of an engine momentarily having to work under an additional load. Somewhere back up near the farmhouse, the chainsaw had found flesh. They got Andy. No! She wept. The bastards. They'd probably got Kemper as well. But she had to keep going. Erin picked herself up and continued along the narrow horse trail. She had to keep going. She'd used this path three times today, and each time she used it, things had only gotten worse. And now the sun was fading. It was starting to get dark. The night was coming. Andy crawled along the grass, his jaws clenched, one hand, two hand. He heaved, he pulled, he crawled. He was determined to get away. Saliva fell from his lips as he panted and grunted with exertion. His powerful build was now standing him in good stead. As he used the strong muscles in his arms and shoulders to... He was lifted off the ground and slung over one broad, stinking shoulder like a side of beef. That's how easy it had been for this bastard to take him. And now Andy could see he was being carried back towards the farmhouse, the tall black windows bouncing up and down with each lumbering step. Andy shouted for help, but there was no one to hear him. Blood squirted from his severed leg, pumping with his throbbing heartbeat, running down onto the cured human flesh of the killer's apron. Andy could feel his arms rub against the killer's face, against the dead, putrid skin of the homemade mask. It dawned on Andy as he kicked and fought in vain that he was punching and biting the skin ripped from another innocent body. With nothing to do but sit and wait, Pepper and Morgan had finally overcome their revulsion and begun to do their best to clean the inside of the van. They'd been wiping up the mess with a couple of Kemper's shop rags, but also had to use some of their spare traveling clothes. They'd soak the makeshift wipes in water, some of which they had on board the van. The rest Pepper had found, not too stagnant, in an open metal drum nearby. But it was hard. Barely a second went by when either one of them didn't feel nauseous. They totally had to forget what it was they were mopping up. In the same way that most people forget about the bolt gun slamming between the open eyes of a cow before sitting down to a plate of beef. The fact that they were now working in hastening darkness didn't make things any easier. Suddenly the van rocked. What? They looked up from the stained back seat and saw Aaron. She'd come back. Not said a word, just jumped straight into the driver's seat. She looked terrified. Aaron was fumbling with the car keys. She'd pulled them out of the pocket, reached forward, but her hands were shaking. What the fuck? Morgan called, confused. 
Erin was shivering all over. She couldn't keep still. You okay? Asked Pepper. Both she and Morgan had stopped what they were doing and were now stooping forward towards the front. Where's the gun? Shouted Erin, referring to the snub-nosed revolver, the one the girl had put in her mouth and then used to drill a hole through the back of her head. The, the sheriff took it. Answered Pepper. Shit! Aaron slammed the steering wheel with both hands. She then attempted to slide the key in the ignition. Aaron! Tried Morgan again. What is going on? Now she turned to look at them, and they could see the state she was in. Her eyes were red with tears. She had snot running down from her nose, and her mouth was dripping with saliva. She looked awful. Clearly something was very, very wrong, and the time for words was over. Pepper got out and went round to sit in the front passenger seat. Morgan closed all the doors, then took his place on the back seat and held on tight. Whatever it was that had happened, whatever Aaron had seen and wherever Andy and Kemper were, Morgan really didn't want to know. Aaron still couldn't get the key in the damn ignition. She was still shaking too much. Pepper reached over and with a soft hand helped Aaron guide the key into place. Finally, some action. Aaron turned the key, put the van in gear, and raised the clutch too fast. The van stalled. Fuck! Shouted Aaron. She tried to restart the engine, but it was flooded. Flooded! How could it be flooded when she'd only tried to turn it once? Kemper! He was supposed to be good with cars, so how come his own goddamn wheels go ass-end up the first time anyone turns the goddamn fucking key? Kemper! Morgan took off his glasses and was about to wipe them on his t-shirt when he thought he saw something slip by outside. Pepper had seen it too, but Aaron only caught sight of the shadow when it passed right by her open window. She couldn't believe she'd come this far, only to be let down by the stupid, dumb clutch. The shadow drew nearer to her window, and Aaron screamed. Andy was being carried through the metal door, the same door this bastard came out of. He was lying straddled across the heaving shoulder of his attacker, and could feel the dense ripples of fat undulate with each step the maniac took. Andy tried to resist, God how he tried, even though he knew it was no use, not when someone had complete physical power over him like this. And even if he broke free, how far would he get on one useless, pathetic leg? But that was his brain talking. And right now, Andy was only listening to the screaming demands of sheer, bloody survival. He was being taken down a narrow staircase. Oh, God, no. It was dark down there. He reached out and clawed at the paneled walls either side of him. But his scratch marks merely added to the hundreds that were already there. He cried out in pain as one of his fingernails tore away and embedded itself in the wall. He could see it as he descended, red and clear with blood and soft tissue. The pain was agonizing, and now he could see that the way ahead of him was steeped in shadow, lit only by a blazing furnace, and he screamed and screamed and screamed, but nothing the boy could do did anything to slow his descent into the basement, an inception of the final act of madness. Aaron's scream had barely subsided when the shadowy figure of Sheriff Hoyt came up to the driver's window. Young lady, what seems to be the problem? His voice was reassuring, firm and comforting, 
and almost immediately Aaron felt like an idiot for screaming. But then none of them had seen what she had just seen up at the Hewitt farmhouse. The crazy old man and that... that thing. Now she could tell the sheriff. She could tell him about Andy, Kemper, and the perverted shape of a man with the chainsaw. The sheriff could help her. He could go up there with his gun and put them under arrest, maybe even shoot the bastards, and who knows, they might still be in time to save the guys. Only Sheriff Hoyt didn't seem too concerned with Aaron's obvious needs right now. Her eager face, desperate for his help and his strength, was lost on him. Instead, he just looked right past the girl and stared at the open ashtray where he saw... The police officer reached forward and picked a spent roach up out from the burnt ash. He smelt it, and he suddenly changed his expression. He stood upright and took a cold, hard look at the kids. "'Somebody care to explain this?' he asked, holding the joint towards them. Uh, "'Stuttered Morgan. "'Sir, that—' "'You kids using drugs?' interrupted the sheriff, tersely, his manner immediately formal. "'Not me, sir,' answered Morgan nervously. The young man was surprised to see the sheriff back at all, especially the way he'd seemed to creep up on them like that. They didn't even hear his car. But now that he was back, Morgan was glad to see him. Maybe the sheriff could help Aaron with whatever she'd seen up at the farmhouse, something Morgan and Pepper still knew nothing about. But the sheriff didn't seem to want to listen to Aaron now that he'd found the joint. Hoyt stepped back and took a look at the van, the kids, and the whole damn sorry scene. Not me, sir, the sheriff repeated quietly as if Morgan had been feeding him a line. He then closed his eyes and inhaled deeply. Morgan and Pepper quickly exchanged a look as if to say, what's that all about? Aaron just wanted the cop to get to the point so that she could send him up to the farmstead, get the van started, and get the goddamn motherfucker out of town. But the sheriff kept his eyes shut and sniffed deeply before finally declaring, I smell bullshit. Then he opened his eyes and looked Morgan dead in the face. Andy screamed and cried out. He tried to struggle. He tried. He felt the quivering, fleshy hands lift him by his shoulders, pinning his arms to his side, hoisting him up in the air like he was nothing but a child's toy. All around Andy was the detritus of nightmares, a dark room strewn with limbs and slaughterhouse debasement. The cellar was the room where evil things were done. His eyes came to rest on the meat hook. No. The meat hook was high above the ground and looming closer. Andy was being carried towards it. The bastard wouldn't let him go. Andy was completely in his power and completely helpless. The meat hook was almost in Andy's face when he was suddenly turned around and lifted high. The meat hook was behind him. The meat hook was... Andy was lowered and suddenly, the pain, Andy screamed. The hands weren't holding him anymore but he was still high up off the floor, his foot suddenly dangling as he forced himself to accept the fact that he'd been hung up on the meat hook. With each thrash and twitch of his body, the hook bit deeper into his back, ripping organs, tearing meat, and breaking sinew. His cries were heartbreaking and primal, but the piercing eyes that stared up at him through the human skin mask were feverish with excitement. Night had fallen. All three of them were now out of the van and lying face down in the dirt in front of the old Crawford Mill. 
Morgan was terrified, but the tears they could hear in the darkness came from Pepper. Sheriff Hoyt stood over them, pacing back and forth in his black leather boots. He was checking their driver's licenses, ID, wallets, anything they had. The atmosphere was so thick with understated menace, you could almost touch it. Aaron couldn't understand what all this was about. There was a maniac with a fucking chainsaw up at the Hewitt place, and here the sheriff was wasting time over a fucking joint? It didn't make sense. It was totally out of proportion. She'd been trying to make him listen, but he wouldn't. He just kept barking orders at them. Step out of the vehicle. Assume the position. Get on the ground. But every second that passed made it more likely they'd be too late to save Kemper and Andy. Before Aaron knew it, she was crying. She was lying there, her cheek against the soil, crying. You... you gotta help him! She wailed, trying to make the bastard listen. He's killing him! Hoyt took his eyes from Morgan's driving license. Now we're getting somewhere, he said. Then he went and stood over Aaron, leaned down and bellowed, Who's killing who? She couldn't believe it. She had encountered obstacles every step of the way. There were the murderers up at the house, and now her friends were lying on the ground like criminals. The sheriff, he should help people. Aaron couldn't get the words out. Hoyt never gave her a chance, and now that she had room to speak, there was too much she wanted to say. Oh God, it was overloading her mind. She kept coming back to the image of the guy wearing human skin over his face. Aaron pointed feebly towards the overgrown trail that led to the Hewitts. Now that it was night, it was impossible to see a thing through the trees. Her voice was broken. She was half pleading and half screaming. He's right over there! You got to believe me! As she spoke, she began to lift herself up off the ground. She needed to talk to the sheriff to make him see reason. Hoyt placed the sole of his boot firmly in the square of her back and shoved the girl back down. You keep your pretty little ass in the dirt until I say otherwise. <laughs> oh my god. Said Pepper. She'd suddenly remembered what the girl in the van had said. You're all gonna die, is what she had said. Officer, please. Said Morgan, sincere in his appeal to the policeman's authority. If only Hoyt would just listen, just for one second. Aaron, however, was going way beyond the point of reason. The situation was wrong. It was impossible. Impossible. It couldn't be happening. What the fuck? She screamed. But Hoyt simply looked down on her the way he'd regard any potential suspect. That makes two of us, he agreed sarcastically. She could scream as much as she wanted, but she wasn't going anywhere. None of them were, till he made some progress. You want to know what I think, he said, standing so close that his boots were almost in Aaron's face. I think your boyfriend shot that poor girl and then ran off. He did not. Aaron snapped back, then under her breath. You ignorant prick. <laughs> Why would you listen to her? Pepper implored. Morgan started to move. They were all getting restless. Enough. The sheriff pulled a gun out of his holster and fired a bullet straight down into the dirt. <laughs> Pepper and Aaron screamed. Are you ladies gonna calm yourselves down? Barked the sheriff. Or do I have to do it for you? All three of them were now crying, even Morgan. They were terrified, their breathing was hard, fast, and loud, and they were so scared that none of them noticed that the revolver Hoyt had taken from his holster was the .357 snub nose used by the dead girl. Andy's eyelids were becoming heavier and heavier. He tried to keep watch to see what his attacker was doing, but it was hard. The pain from the meat hook was unbearable, but not for a moment did the boy get to enjoy the blessed release of a blackout. Instead, all he could do was watch in mounting horror as his attacker shuffled about this 
hellish basement, moving, panting, sweating, picking up his butchery tools, then putting them down again. The brute's movements were erratic, random, a chaotic, aberrant psychopath fidgeting among a cesspool of cleavers, knives, sharpeners, meat presses, bone dusters, and jars of bleach and preservatives. This was the place where limbs were severed and where lives came to an end by the breaking of moist pink gristle. Andy saw him reach a massive bloody hand into a barrel of rock salt, and then he came forward and was upon the boy his corpulent body heaving with mania as he lifted the rock salt and rammed it deep into Andy's open wounds. Clearly at ease with the kid's discomfort, the sheriff ambled over to Kemper's van. Neat job, customized exhaust, raised rear and chrome hubs, pity about the hole in the window. He stopped by the open side door and waited. He had everything under control just fine. When they quit whining, he could continue with his investigation. Folk had to learn that they couldn't just come driving through his town, breaking any goddamn law they chose. Maybe people did that sort of thing up in New York or over in L.A., but not here, not in Fuller, Travis County. Tears subsiding, Morgan looked up and saw that the sheriff had been waiting for his attention. Hoyt blamed him for the joint. He hadn't said so, but Morgan could tell. Thank God they dumped the piñata. Come here, boy, said the sheriff calmly. Why? I want to know exactly what happened in this van. Morgan was confused. We already told you what happened. It was good to see the sheriff behave rationally again, but they'd covered all this when he'd come before and picked up the body. You told me, replied the sheriff. Now you're gonna show me. The way Hoyt said that, Morgan didn't like it one little bit. He turned his head toward the girls lying on the ground next to him, and he could see it in their eyes as well. None of them trusted the sheriff one damn bit, but what could the boy do? Slowly, almost grudgingly, Morgan got up. He had dirt all down the front of his clothes, where it mingled with his sweat. Aaron and Pepper almost begged him with their eyes not to go with the sheriff, but they didn't dare say a word, not since the sheriff had fired off that gunshot. Hoyt stood waiting by the open side door, waiting for the city boy to take his sweet little time. What these kids didn't seem to quite understand was that Sheriff Hoyt was the law around these parts. He did things his way. There were no other officers for miles, so if he said jump, then they'd better learn to goddamn jump. Still holding the revolver, Hoyt stood aside to let the boy climb aboard the van. Not a word passed between them as Morgan entered through the side door. The boy tried to read Hoyt's face. What were the sheriff's thoughts? Was he enjoying this? Was he one of those sadistic lone gun deep south cops you had heard about? Or was he really just trying to do his job? Was this just his backwoods way of doing things? Like some testosterone fueled gunslinger? Morgan couldn't tell. But whatever Hoyt was thinking, the boy was determined to do nothing to piss him off. He would do anything and everything Sheriff Hoyt told him to, and maybe, just maybe, they'd all see their way out of the woods. Morgan sat on the corner of the back seat as far as possible from the blood. There was a lot of mess that he and Pepper hadn't got round to, getting the cleaning before Aaron showed. Through the open door, he could see the two young women lying face down on the ground. It was crazy. There wasn't much light in the van. The moon was good, but other than that, they had to rely on the small interior door lamp. "'Is this where she was sitting?' asked the sheriff, standing half in and half out of the side door. "'Yeah,' replied Morgan. He couldn't be sure, but now that they were closer, he thought he could smell liquor on the sheriff's breath. "'Bourbon?' Then how did her brains wind up on the window? Morgan turned round to look at the bloody hole in the glass. It was clear that the trajectory didn't add up from where he was sitting now. She might have 
Been a little more to the middle, he offered. Well, prompted the sheriff. Then sit more to the middle. Morgan looked at the blood on the seat. Bone chips and morsels of brain were still clearly visible. But... Come on, it's just blood. Morgan closed his eyes for a moment, then reluctantly slid right over onto where the girl had been sitting when she shot herself. The round red crack in the rear window was dead center behind his head. It was freaking him out. Okay, nodded the sheriff. Then what? Th th then muttered the boy, shaken by the recall. She sh 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 shot herself. Hoyt leaned back, withdrawing his face into shadow. How? Morgan couldn't see him. What do you mean? From out of the darkness, the sheriff offered the suicide gun to Morgan, holding it out, pointing the barrel straight at the boy. Morgan tried desperately to see the sheriff's face, but it was impossible. Show me, said the sheriff. What? Asked Morgan, incredulous. It was clear what the sheriff wanted him to do, but the boy couldn't believe it. He left the gun right where it was in Sheriff Hoyt's hand. It helps me clarify things if I have a distinct visual image, Hoyt explained matter-of-factly. No response. Take the gun! Morgan looked at the gun in bewilderment. His emotions had been on a ball sack of a coaster ride all day. He didn't need this. Hoyt tried to make the decision easy for him. Either you're gonna cooperate or I'm gonna arrest you for obstruction. The gun was still pointed at Morgan, the barrel aiming straight for him. If the sheriff wanted, he could shoot the boy here and now. Morgan tried to see the sheriff's face to get a measure of him, but Hoyt made sure he stayed well back in the darkness. Morgan was terrified. He'd seen enough cop shows to know that if he took the gun, his prints would be all over it. What if the sheriff was trying to frame him? Why couldn't the idiot simply accept it had been a suicide? The sheriff pushed the gun forward, almost all the way into Morgan's hand. Morgan looked at it, the gun that had sent their day spiraling down into madness. He had no choice. Slowly, with a trembling hand, Morgan reached out. His jittering fingers touched the barrel. That's it, said Hoyt encouragingly. Take the gun. Morgan pulled on the end of the revolver. It wouldn't move. The sheriff wouldn't let go. Hoyt leaned forward into the light, his broad face creasing with sadistic relish. And when Morgan saw the sheriff place a calloused finger on the trigger of the revolver, the boy knew he was dead. The game was over. Someone turned a TV on. It was loud, loud enough to stir Andy's consciousness into feeling the searing pain of the rock salt and the deep, rending agony of the meat hook. And the horror played on. Mass skin flailing, the blood-shitting freak scurried about the clutter of his domain, neatly tearing a sheet of brown paper from a dispenser, testing a pair of meat shears, oiling and taking careful, methodical care of them. He snipped off a length of brown twine, bustling through the corroded symbols of his spiritual pathology, working, laboring, and pounding for some ultimate goal, some senseless act of visceral human reduction. Morgan sighed, waiting for the inevitable, when the sheriff relaxed his grip and placed the gun fully inside the boy's hand. The bastard. Show me, said the sheriff, suddenly a picture of formality, carved in razor-edge uncertainty. You, you want me to? Morgan left the question unfinished. He knew what the sheriff wanted him to do, but he was determined not to do it. He couldn't, but the sheriff nodded. He wanted the boy to put the gun inside his mouth, just like the girl did. 
He wanted Morgan to place his own lips around the same cold metal she had kissed just before she died. Morgan's hands started to tremble even more. He couldn't do it. He saw her in his mind's eye. It was this gun. She used this same damn gun. He started to cry. Come on now, you can do it, said the sheriff. Show me! Only the sound of his voice wasn't supportive or reassuring. If anything, the police officer sounded greedy. And now there was that hungry look in his eyes again. The same look he'd had when he'd teased the boy by keeping hold of the gun. Just what did this bastard want? Shaking, terrified, and humiliated, Morgan swallowed hard and began to raise the gun. He tried to lift it right up to get it all over with, but he couldn't. He just couldn't bring himself to place the suicide weapon anywhere near his mouth, and he kept his fingers well away from the trigger. Hoyt began to grow impatient. Quit wasting my goddamn time! Please, no, I... Morgan? Called Aaron from outside. You okay? The guys had been in the van a long time, and they were talking low. The girls had no idea what was going on. Shivering with fear, Morgan forced himself to bring the barrel under his jaw. His teeth had begun to chatter and his hand was shaking wildly. Once, twice, the end of the gun flicked up and hit him on the chin. How far did the sheriff want him to go? Oh my God! Morgan lifted his gaze from the deadly weapon and looked into the sheriff's eyes. Hoyt was watching him the way the spider watches a fly, all the while preserving the thin veneer that separated investigation from intimidation. Inquity from insanity. You sure she did it like that? He asked slyly. <laughs> yes, stuttered the boy, his jaw still rattling freely. Hoyt paused, watched Morgan tremble, and then... How'd she shoot herself without her finger on the trigger? Oh God, please! Put your goddamn finger on the trigger! Please stop! Put your finger on the trigger! A flood of warm tears streamed down Morgan's face, and he started to weep uncontrollably, verging on hysteria, with the gun still held close to his mouth. Sheriff Hoyt had broken him. He'd used his authority and strength of will to completely crush the kid, and he'd been able to do it because everything about the sheriff made it clear that he was comfortable with violence. He lived with violence. He had used violence and wasn't afraid of violence. And that's what made him different from the three of them. And in Morgan's eyes, that's what made Sheriff Hoyt inhuman. The threat of violence underscored everything the sheriff said and did. So although it was Morgan who held the gun, it was the police officer that had all the power. The bedroom was a dark, depressing hovel laden with memories. Nothing had changed over the years, not since childhood. The wallpaper was a peeling, faded print of cowboys at a rodeo. And there were old-school pennants stuck on the walls, except the pennants were stolen. The boy who'd slept in this room never went to school. He wasn't allowed. When all the other kids saw him, they'd screamed. Even the adults had screamed. They still screamed. The only people who didn't scream were family, and when family were home, it was the boy who'd screamed over and over. His mind had grown out of a morass of retarded savagery, where fighting, wounds, and separating meat had held sway. They had beaten each other, all his family screaming, fighting, cutting, feeding. No, the school pennants weren't his. They'd belonged to the cute, clever kids he'd murdered, disemboweled, and worn. He'd taken everything the kids had and their families. Now that he was much older, he still heard the squealing of the animals. Like when he'd got a job at the slaughterhouse. The only thing he'd been good for. Where he'd beaten the animals over the head and killed them. He'd strangled them with his bare hands. He'd stabbed them in the eyes. 
He put a sackcloth over their heads and rammed a chainsaw straight through their mouths. He defeated, slaughtered, and rolled them simply because he could, just like family. Like people, where violence and death put food on the table, where death created meaning and power. Every day since he'd been born, he'd lived in a slaughterhouse, and this was his room, his room at the Hewitt farmhouse. He had worked hard today. There had been a lot to get done, but it was almost all over. He could draw the brown drapes and sit down to work by the sputtering electric lamplight. No one could see him as he sat alone unmasked, the profile of his face horribly indented where his nose should have been. Alone, the harvesting butcher stuffed one of his cankerous hands into a deep bowl of moist animal fat. He then scooped up a thick gobbet of shit grease and smoothed it into the flesh resting in his lap, a newly cut face, caressing, massaging, lubricating. He sat in an armchair, the flaccid red skin lying softly in his groin, fingering the face and the new expression that he might put on. Slowly now, he wrapped the tender skin round his face and pulled the thick scalp of hair over his head. Then gently, savagely, excitedly, he took up needle and coarse thread and began to sew the new encasement tightly around his head. As his stitching pulled the different sections of severed skin together in a suffocating helmet of murdered flesh, he began to pant with delirium. Soon he could barely move, his head firmly restricted in the new leather mask. Yet still he pulled more tightly on the thread. It was smothering him, thrilling him, becoming him. A few moments later and the job was complete. He broke the needle free from the final length of catgut with a grunt, then sank back in his chair, spent. And for a moment, he felt very, very tired. in there shouted Aaron as she lay face down on the ground pepper gave her a look of concern they couldn't hear everything that was going on between morgan and the sheriff but they'd heard enough to know that something wasn't right Aaron began to climb up to her feet but the sheriff had seen her don't you dare get up he threatened her his face turning right round to scowl at her through the open side door she lay down again leaving the sheriff to carry on where he'd left off. But when Hoyt turned back to look at Morgan again, he found himself staring down the barrel of a gun. Morgan was holding the revolver, point blank in the sheriff's face. You son of a bitch! shouted Morgan, terrified yet furious that the sheriff had driven him so close to the brink of his own mortality and sanity. Get on the floor! he shouted, and now his finger was on the trigger. The sheriff didn't budge. Easy, boy. Morgan? Called Aaron. What the hell was going on? I got his gun! Shouted Morgan. I got his fucking gun! The two young women got up off the ground. None of this was real. It couldn't be happening. What the hell are you doing? Called Aaron. She could see Morgan was shaking from head to toe with uncontrollable fear. He was a loaded gun full of dangerous adrenaline. Oh no! Said the boy. Where's a fucking wacko? The sheriff calmly stared down the business end of the shooter. He didn't flinch. He didn't budge. He didn't do a thing. You girls see this, right? He said calmly. You're witnesses. Another dilemma. Another crazy dilemma. All day long, it had been confusion and choices, and now they had to choose between backing their friend or talking him into handing the gun over to the sheriff. Sure, Hoyt had acted like a total lunatic, but he was still the law. Of course, neither Pepper nor Aaron knew what the sheriff had done to Morgan, in the boy's mind, and now the sheriff seemed to be trying to play all three of them off against one another, so that he could regain their advantage which might have worked if Morgan hadn't got the measure of the sick bastard. Morgan knew what the sheriff was doing. I told you to get on the floor! 
shouted the boy, moving the gun right up between the sheriff's eyes. Hoyt ignored the threat and continued to study the boy's irresolute face, reading his every scared emotion. He pulls that trigger, said Hoyt loudly. You girls are accomplices, you know that. Aaron and Pepper didn't know what to do. It was all too much. They'd had the suicide. Kemper had gone missing and Aaron had seen that maniac up at the farmhouse. And now what was happening? Was Morgan going to be a cop killer? What should I do? Cried Morgan, almost screaming with fear. I don't know answered Pepper, her voice torn with unrestrained emotion. Should I shoot him? Aaron stepped forward. This had gone too far. They had to work things out with the sheriff. He was the law. They had to convince him to go up to the farmhouse for Andy's sake. Put down the gun, Morgan. She tried to sound calm, but her voice cracked. Hoyt pushed his head forward, ramming his brow into the cold steel barrel of the gun. You shit hill! he shouted. No cocksucker was going to mess with the sheriff in his own town. Morgan wavered, the gun suddenly heavy in his hand. I already got you for assault, Hoyt raged, but the boy shouted over him. You're lying! The sheriff sniffed and eyed him calmly. Pull the trigger, you little shit, and find out! Aaron could see it all. Morgan brandishing the gun, scared out of his wits and capable of anything. The sheriff goading Morgan, urging him on, pushing his face into the weapon. There was only one tragic way this could end. Morgan, put it down! She shouted. The boy looked at the two girls. Pepper and Aaron were now standing right up by the open side door and he then looked at the sheriff in his leering, domineering, fat, Texan fuck of a face. Go ahead, sneered the sheriff. Pull it. If it's loaded, you'll get away scot-free. But folks round here don't like cop killers. Tears ran down Morgan's cheeks. You motherfucker! Aaron could see it coming, almost as if time was slowing down. Morgan, don't! The sheriff's sneering face pushed closer. Do it, you pussy! Pull the fucking trigger! Pull it! Pull it! The moment. Freeze frame. Eyes. Aaron. Pepper. Hoyt. The gun. Fear. Mockery. Panic. The boy's finger went tight. The barrel was on the sheriff's head. The hammer cocked. No! Morgan pulled the trigger. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 10 of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake. We're really getting into the, the meat of the story here. No, well, maybe a pun intended, who knows. Uh, really enjoying the stuff with the sheriff, even more so than it played off in the movie. Uh, really tense scene with him and Morgan uh, in the flick, but here in the book it's even more tense in my opinion. And we get into the heads of Aaron and Pepper more. You know, as they're laying out there on the ground wondering what the fuck's going on. And, uh, you know, when it comes time, when it comes time for them to get involved after Morgan's got the gun on the sheriff, you know, just, just, the, it's like, what do we do? You know, are we, do we kill the sheriff, get out of here? Everything's been fucked all day, or do we try to get out of this? Uh, so yeah, I'm really enjoying this so far. Uh, God, that rock salt thing with Andy's leg. Oh, just in the movie, it's, oh. Uh, but in the book, yeah, just as much. Um, I did enjoy the little scene we got in this chapter with Leatherface sitting in the armchair, putting on the new mask. We all know whose face that is. Um, I really like getting into Leatherface's head there, you know, getting a little bit of his backstory and uh, what he thinks and feels, even though, you know, he's really mentally challenged. Uh, you don't get a lot of that in the movies with him. 
Uh, that's what I enjoy about these slasher books, getting into their heads like Chucky's backstory in the, in the Child's Play books. Uh, Jason, uh, the time that we didn't, between the time he drowned and, you know, as an adult and started killing, that stuff was cool. Uh, finding out about past victims of Freddy's before he died, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I really enjoyed getting into Leatherface's psyche a little bit as he was uh, making his new mask. Well, he pulled, Morgan pulled the trigger, so if you've never seen the movie, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I'll be back very soon with the next chapter of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, the 2003 remake novelization by Stephen Hand. Uh, all the voices, uh, voice cast is doing great. Uh, if you would like to voice a character in one in a book every month on the channel, uh, all you got to do is sign up on the Patreon page, support the channel at at least ten dollars or more per month, and uh, you can voice a character in every book I do if you want to, as long as you're a patron. And uh, you'll be keeping the channel going and growing for years to come. All right, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80s slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other.